Um, you are working on idea markets or yes. I, yeah. So what is the problem we have? Anyone who's connected to the internet knows that we have a problem with uh, sense making or with figuring out what the truth is. And I think it's a problem that we've actually had for a long time, but given um, internet access and given that everyone has a platform and that they can just spread uh, information, um, this idea of um, truth seeking or fact checking or just getting an idea about what's actually going on, it's really front and center in the minds of, of uh, I'd say the digitally connected today. Um, there's this idea of living in a post truth world um, you know, that, that we're living in. Um, so what, I guess maybe we could just begin by like discussing what a fiat narrative is, cause that might be a good place to start. Sure. Uh, I, I drew the connection between, uh, public narratives and fiat currencies, uh, because I was talking particularly to the crypto audience that really cares about the distinction between fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. Um, fiat being every, backed by the government or like government mandated currency. Yes. Yeah. Every, everybody knows what a fiat narrative is, even if that term isn't familiar. Fiat refers to something being uh, by declaration. So current fiat currencies are valuable because a government says they are. And fiat narratives are true because a big media corporation or authority says they are. Uh, and everybody watching this has had some experience of a corporate media or authority saying something is true or perpetuating a narrative um, that is not useful, not true, not optimal, not helpful. Uh, and yet uh, is regarded as the credible thing. The, the, the boundaries of, of credibility are defined by these uh, corporate media gatekeepers. So a fiat narrative is the public narrative that is maintained by declaration only, by the declaration of these private media corporations and, and the authorities that they cooperate with. It's, it's funny that Trump kind of, uh, you know, with his fake news thing, has kind of done us a service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, let me, let me take back my absolutely a little bit. I don't mean to <laughs> sound, sound like a, like a no, no, know, no, full, no. full-throated endorsement, but uh, I, I actually do believe that the veneer of uh, sincerity being taken off of public discourse has had some benefits and has accelerated the um, awakening of, of people in a way and the uh, justified skepticism of people, uh, which then leads to people making their own judgments as to relying on authority figures and simply believing whatever they say. And right now, the form of the form that everyone making their own judgments takes is this disunity, this disintegration of consensus. Uh, but underneath that, it's it's people who care more about the truth than about uh, fitting in with the status quo uh, perpetuated by corporate media. And I think there's something fundamentally respectable and good about that. Mm. It's um, something that's really been made apparent with this whole coronavirus thing. Like yes. I remember just watching the news and listening to what the WHO said, you know, the World Health Organization, not the band. Um, yeah, the band would have done a better job. <laughs> probably, probably. And I was just watching this and I'm like, well, some of, that doesn't seem right. Like that, that's, that might sound a bit off. And then I go on Twitter and I read, um, you know, what other people are saying and people who are, you know, experts in, uh, complex systems, epidemiology, even part of the VC community and, you know, piecing together like a different worldview that's being presented to me. Like masks are actually good. I mean, I think that's the dumbest, like I cannot believe that that was even put forward. Like you put a mask on and you blow, you can't feel your hand, you can't feel, you know, um, the yeah. wind on your, like it, 
even if some gets through, you still don't feel as much. Like it limits it. So yeah. this, the mind games that, that have been played is are, are just ridiculous. But what I found to be incredibly interesting is the power of the swarm of collective intelligence and in that people, you know, um, working together, um, distributed, you know, across the world through, through these networks, like the power of um, uh, well, truth seeking or, you know, the, the epistemic utility there is, is profound. And it's one yeah. that we're not tapping into enough. Yeah. Um, and I guess you have an idea that could help us, um, help us find some truth and to, and to link incentives with this truth seeking. And yeah. we call it a, an idea market. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea behind idea markets is that beliefs are investments that when we believe something it's because we think we'll get more benefit out of this alternative than that alternative. And that's not really, uh, explicit anywhere though it is it is sort of uh implicit when we when we commit to uh a position on something we're we're placing a bet if we're wrong there are objective costs to us and if we're right there are objective benefits and uh, an idea market is sort of a a mechanism for collective ideological risk management it incentivizes people to examine uh, all the possible narratives, all the information uh, without a particular regard for corporate media uh, to find what is undervalued, to find what is actually the best uh, of the alternatives, not just what is repeated by a big brand name or something like that. So what, what an idea market ultimately does is it, takes it allocates trust to where it's deserved right now the media corporations are trusted implicitly even by the people who don't trust them uh, to decide what narratives are legitimate to decide the bounds of legitimacy Uh, one example of this is the new york times recently started talking about ufos with a level of uh, credibility that uh, they never had before. And the UFO community, even though they all hate the New York Times because they've been ignoring them for 75 years, uh, rejoiced because the New York Times, whether you like them or not, has this, pos- this position of arbitership. So the, uh, the point of idea markets is to replace this sort of centralized arbitership by media corporation with democratic arbitership via the free market. People, uh, by betting on publishers, essentially, by put, risking capital to say, I trust this journalist or this publisher and what they're saying, and I believe other people will too. Uh, we're inviting people to allocate trust to where it's actually deserved and to create this public signal on a level playing field on which all publishers compete. So media corporations and you know, joesblog.com are on the same market. And, uh, and when people trust one more than the other, there's nothing to stop one from overtaking the other. Does that begin to make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, how is it a, a market? Like, do I buy like, you know, shares, perhaps it's the wrong term, but I, I invest in these, in these publishers, right? On, yes. on this platform, there are a list of publishers and I can choose to invest in them with the hope that there's a return, right? Like I put my money where my mouth is, like that you're trying to- inst- Absolutely. Yeah. So I should, I, I will absolutely explain that next. So if you use Reddit, you have, you have yeah. upvotes that curate the content. Well, the problem with that is upvotes are free. So it's very easily gamed. And Reddit actually, uh, you know, accidentally released a report a few years ago in 2015 saying uh, that their most addicted city is actually uh, an, an Air Force base in Arkansas that's famous for its research on social manipulation, social media manipulation and information control and stuff like that. 
So Reddit is, is well known to be at least somewhat compromised, even though it's still very fun and very useful. Uh, what Idea Markets does is it makes upvotes expensive. What you're doing is all of the all of the listings on the market. On Wall Street, each listing is a company. On Idea Markets, each listing is a primary domain. It's something.com, something.org. It's where the publishers live. It's their brand. And when you buy an upvote, uh, you increase the rank of that publisher. You can buy as many upvotes as you like, but they do get, ex get more expensive. And in this way, we can rank things in sort of a Reddit fashion, but with a mind to the possibility that if we do a bad job, it will cost us money. And if we do a great job, it could make us money. So it takes the incentives of stock market investing, the requirement for due diligence and carefulness and research, uh, and willingness to uh, question preconceived notions and applies it to the sort of democratic curation of Reddit uh, to surface the most trustworthy publications as defined by what people are willing to actually risk money on. So how do the publishers, how does that money get transferred to publishers? To the publishers, yes. So we were talking earlier about DeFi, decentralized uh, banking and decentralized lending. So the entire, all of the software for idea markets is a, is a protocol on the Ethereum network, on the main network where all the DeFi action is happening. So when you buy uh, an upvote on idea markets, your money gets locked into a, a software bank, basically, that holds it and lends it to other users out the side. And then that money, that deposit that you use to buy tokens to buy upvotes earns interest. And like I said earlier, it's 10 to 100 times more than a typical bank account's uh, interest provides. So what the software behind Idea Markets does is it takes the interest that accrues to the deposits that people used to buy upvotes and it sends that interest directly to the publisher for whom the votes are cast. Does that all make sense at yeah, once? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the bigger I'm the pie. Big fan, yeah, so yeah. if I'm, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, I just wanna make no, sure. No, 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 please, make, please. Make it all in one place, make it easy. If, uh, if you're a big Slate Star Codex fan and Slate Star Codex gets a million dollars in upvotes, uh, the interest that accrues to that million dollars uh, goes right to Scott Alexander. And so if, if there's a million dollars and the interest rates will fluctuate it'll be between $10,000 and $100,000 a year. And that's completely independent of ads, subscriptions, donations, or any of the other very broken business models uh, upon which journalism relies right now. Mm -hmm. So this could, individual bloggers all the way to, you know, the New York Times, these, yes. these huge media platforms can all be listed on these, on idea markets. Can and will, yes. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a level playing field. It's a literal marketplace of ideas with yeah. the incentives of a marketplace uh, so, for the first time in human history. Yeah, and as an investor, how does that, like I buy into this organization or this blogger and can I just, do I get, um, can I just cash out whenever or do I get yeah. like a dividend? Like how does that operate? You cash out whenever, so the users, in the early versions will only profit on speculation. They'll only profit on buy low, sell high, uh, kind of like any other commodity. Uh, so if you think Slate Star Codex deserves to rank a lot higher than it currently does, you buy. And if people who come after you agree and they vote it up, then you can sell it at a higher price. Or if you buy and then Scott Alexander commits some horrible crime and everybody sells and you're left holding the bag, then you, you've lost money because the earlier investors have sold out from under you. So it's really modeled after the stock market experience, which people are already very familiar with. Okay. Um, one question I have is there's lots of, uh, there's lots of ideas that I'd bet on, but there's not many yeah. institutions or yeah. you know, media companies. 
Yeah. So why did you choose to go for the publishers? I mean, there's obviously the, it's easy. It's easier, right? You've got the domain name. It wouldn't be as obvious to bet on ideas and how you'd actually figure out whether or not an idea is good or not. I guess, I guess the public, the, the, the market would do that. But why did you choose to go with publishers? Yes, we do have ideas for how to specifically rank individual ideas. And that is part of you know, the grand vision and, and we'll get there someday. Yeah. But right now, uh, whom to trust is the big pain point of the world. And uh, what we are doing is having people bet on ideas using publishers as a proxy. Because if you are in favor of uh, you know, liberal ideas, then you won't bet on Fox News. You'll find something that represents the ideas that uh, of meaningful and, and important to you, and you will bet on them. And through the increase of their influence, uh, your ideas will uh, gain more visibility as well. So it's it's really only a uh, an abstracted version of that uh, in order to serve this this purpose of allocating trust. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah. It's really exciting as a you know a, a quasi publisher. Like I blog a little bit, and obviously there are podcasts. Um, yeah. So the idea of like having this um, incentive there to, you know, try to promote truth and the fact that I could make a living off of it, I mean, perhaps, you know, is, is, is quite sure. enticing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, I've, I've been thinking about this because I've been, we've all been hit with this uh, problem of, uh, trying to figure out what the what the truth is and or what might be um, what might be a fact or not. Um, I, I think facts are it's, it's a weird term. So um, yeah, I, I agree. You've probably seen my writing on it, but we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was about to bring that up. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Some. Uh, it was a bad segue. <laughs> All good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you, we. What's the problem with fact checking? The problem with fact checking in a nutshell is that it's impossible. Um, the, the notion of facts is as far as I know, kind of an enlightenment holdover. It's sort of like uh, an atom of truth. It's thought of to be, it's thought of to be this, uh, this little piece of truth where if you, you know, stack a bunch of them together, you get a big truth. But in the meantime, uh, this isn't going anywhere. This little fact isn't going anywhere. Uh, the problem is there's no such, there's no way to draw boundaries around a little piece of truth so that it's, so that it's solid. Uh, and the closer, the more closely you look at what uh, is implied in a fact, the more it looks like a series of judgments. And this is, true of every single fact just based on uh, what, what's required. So for example, if you're on a bus, I heard this, I read this story in a book somewhere. If you're on a bus and a little kid comes up to you and starts you know, punching you in the shoulder and pulling my hair and stuff like that, uh, you know, your reaction is, uh, oh geez, this kid is being annoying. So there's this fact, kid is being annoying. And then maybe the fella across the aisle from you leans over and says, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about Billy. His mother just died and he's just stressed and he's just kind of, you know, letting it out. He's kind of dealing with it. Well, that context changes the meaning of the fact that this kid is being annoying to such a, a vast extent that it can't, it's not recognizable anymore. So when you say this is a fact, you're making all kinds of uh, judgments about what context to leave out. But what context is important? And that context uh, is infinitely variable, constantly changing, and has the ability to make the fact unrecognizable instantly if, if you were to know it or view it from a certain angle. So we treat facts like these little solid, reliable things uh, that are objective and don't involve judgments, but they're actually the complete consequence of infinite judgments, infinite omissions, and uh, the cracks, the cracks in the notion of a fact have now been blown out 
for centuries and billions of people, and those cracks have become giant crevices, and we're all starting to fall through them. Uh, people think uh, we've we've abandoned facts, like uh, it's the fault of the people who simply don't believe the facts. Well, there are often reasons to to disagree with the uh, the omissions that were made in order to create this particular fact. There, there are very human and very legitimate reasons to, to doubt things, to distrust people, to uh, disagree with the story that's being used to color a fact. Um, so there's a lot less uh, justification for moral persecution on the basis of fact denying uh, than is than is happening right now. Uh, the fact people are saying, accusing the deniers of being deniers. They're sort of conducting a, uh, a crusade. Usually it's not a violent crusade, but it's basically, we are absolutely right, you are absolutely, absolutely wrong, and we are just going to hit you in the hammer with this opinion until you submit. Uh, but of course that doesn't work because it's, it's very disrespectful and uh, it's an affront to people's freedom to make it's the these backfire effect interpretations yes people actually so, respond poorly to that sort of stuff i realize i've been i've been talking a lot about this but i'll i'll wrap it up here and say uh your initial question was uh, what's the problem with fact checking the problem with fact checking is you have to rely on the uh, person or party or institution that's doing it. You have to trust them. The problem with fact checking is that even fact checking is a function of trust. It depends on trust. Because if you don't trust the fact checker, then you'll have to fact check that one and you'll have to fact check the fact checker and fact check that fact checker and it's just an infinite regress. So at some point, what the facts are uh, depends on on trust and uh, that's not to say there are no truths or that things are not a certain way uh, but that the metaphor of facts is uh, does it discourages consensus because it pretends to be something that it is not mm -hmm. and I, there, there's a lot of kind of esoteric philosophical stuff in there, but I hope it's somewhat clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, the who will watch the watchman. It's that classic um, discussion. Um, yeah. And the fact that, I'm sorry for using the word fact, <laughs> but, you know, th there are no, facts. Casually, like, casually bring it on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There are these, um, like, Reality is real and there is objective truth, but the question of whether or not we have access to it and whether or not we can actually accurately represent it is a completely different question. Um, yeah, it's a representation problem, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this, the way I think about, um, I guess, knowledge or facts is that there's this thing in the world that we're trying to describe, right? Um, or, just for those watching or listening, I've got a, I'm holding up a coffee mug, but you know, a better, um, the better metaphor, the better analogy is the, the blind men and the elephant. Yes. Um, you know, so there's a, there's an elephant and there are these blind people, uh, and they're all trying to describe what's in front of them. And some guy's got the trunk and this woman's got the tail and then the other person's touching the ears and they all have different ideas about what it is that they are touching. You know, they all think that an elephant is a different thing. Um, yeah. but it's in aggregate that we get a, a picture of what the reality actually is, right? So it's when we combine these perspectives um, that we get a more accurate representation of whatever it is we're trying to understand. And the same is true for, well, everything. It's, it's why public discourse is so important. It's why freedom of speech is so important. And it's why, you know, what you're working on is so important. And it's why we need these uh, developments is why we need to update our social like social media because social media is an incredible force for good and force for you know figuring out the truth yeah but it's also it also amplifies um, well untruth falsity um, well we we don't have a way of 
easily figuring this out. So how do you see these fact-finding technologies, idea markets or others, fitting into this social media landscape and um, empowering people to make decisions or to, to, to figure out whether or not they should believe what they're, what they're seeing? Right, absolutely. So the fundamental issue is not that the facts are necessarily unclear or inaccessible. The internet makes basically all the facts of which humanity is aware accessible. Uh, whether people believe them or not, there they are. It's in, in many cases uh, very, very compelling. So what is stopping humanity from uh, I'm trying to think of, to say of how to say this in a way that is that's very forgiving because I don't believe it's the public's fault at all. No, no. Um, what what is what is creating such uh, division and sort of wildness of thought and belief is not the accessibility of facts. It's the lack of trust and also it's perverse incentives. So since media corporations, and that includes social media corporations, profit uh, largely from advertising and advertising on the internet means page views and page views means circulation, engagement, things like that. The incentives for the most powerful uh, companies, both corporate media and social media, is to generate engagement. And one of the best ways to do that is to provoke outrage or shock, uh, clickbait, things like that. So the public is sort of being farmed of its attention. Uh, the uh, social media and media corporations and everybody else are fighting to extract attention from the public. And, you know, they, they grab the udder, they grab the nipple and they squeeze it. Like, I don't know how many of you people out there, you know, milk the cow or a goat or whatever, but there, there, there's a, a deep science now to uh, the extraction of attention, the farming of attention and having one's attention farmed is not good for the public. It's not good for the people. To train people to click on the clickbait, to engage with the outrage, to uh, share and quote tweet and you know, uh, explode their outrage and get their relatives in a heated discussion that goes on for hours and keeps the New York Times link at the top of your feed is not good for people. It's, uh, it's, we are, we are becoming, to continue the farm metaphor, uh, mimetically modified organisms. We are being trained uh, by ideas uh, to relate to our attention in, in very specific ways. And it is as the crop. It is, the public is having its attention extracted by uh, most powerful and most informed, most skillful advertisers and corporations and uh, social media companies. So there is this perverse incentive. There are these uh, psychoengineering forces uh, working against the public uh, to make them want to give up their attention, to incentivize them to, to give their attention in these ways that benefits them. So uh, your question of how uh, truth-seeking systems uh, work in social media is very much afflicted by this environment where the incentives created by those who profit from the extraction of attention uh, are not even close to aligned with uh, wise uh, personal judgment or epistemic judgment 
or truth seeking or anything like that. Uh, it has nothing to do with that. So people are carried along in this uh, social current that is not toward truth, it's toward uh, attention incontinence. It's toward uh, hysteria. It's toward, it's toward uh, these, these profitable things. Uh, so the starting point is with the public at a great uh, disadvantage, outmatched, outgunned by a century of marketing research and 20 or 30 years of uh, software research on how that can be uh, most well employed to extract attention. So I hope I've kind of hammered that in somewhat. Uh, but that's, that's the starting point. And I have more to say on, on how things could operate and how idea markets come into the picture. But I think, uh, I think that's a good place to start.